The Forbidden History of the Armenian Holocaust by Christopher John Bjorkness James Aratoon Malcolm was an influential Zionist in England of Persian-Armenian descent. He helped the Jewish Zionists, through Supreme Court Justice Louis Dembitz Brandeis, to bring America into the First World War on the side of the British, the Bolsheviks, and the Zionists. Malcolm was treacherous to the Americans and to the Armenians who had just been betrayed and butchered by the Young Turks. Malcolm published numerous letters and articles in the London Times over the course of his adult lifetime, which strongly advocated Zionism, but which rarely mentioned the plight of the Armenians at the hands of the Young Turks and Bolsheviks. He was far more loyal to the interests of the Rothschilds, Sassoons, Zionists, and Jews than to the Armenian people. Malcolm developed a plan for a quid pro quo deal whereby the Zionist Jews in America would force American President Woodrow Wilson to bring America into the First World War on the side of the British. The British would in turn issue the Balfour Declaration to Lord Rothschild, which would pledge to open Palestine up to Jewish settlements. Woodrow Wilson was under blackmail for love letters he had sent to Mrs. Peck, which revealed his adulterous affair. Wealthy American Zionist Jews purchased those letters and used them to blackmail President Wilson. The political Zionist leader, Samuel Landman, confirmed the fact that Zionist Jews had used President Woodrow Wilson to bring America into the war on the side of the Allies in exchange for the Balfour Declaration, which pledged to open up Palestine to Jewish settlement. If Germany should win the First World War, the Zionists would obtain Palestine as a concession to the Jewish bankers for financing Germany's war effort. Should England win the war, the Zionists still would obtain Palestine in exchange for bringing America into the war on the side of the British. Zionist Jews had no loyalty to Turkey, Russia, England, Germany, or America. Their only loyalty was to the Jewish tribe. In fact, many Jews delighted in the vast destruction of the war, which many Jews hoped would leave Europe ripe for Bolshevik revolution and which met their desire for revenge against Rome and millennia of persecution. In 1936, Samuel Landman explained how and why the Zionists had brought America into the war in exchange for the Balfour Declaration. During the critical days of 1916 and of the impending defection of Russia, Jewry as a whole was against the Tsarist regime and had hopes that Germany, if victorious, would in certain circumstances give them Palestine. Several attempts to bring America into the war on the side of the Allies by influencing influential Jewish opinion were made and had failed. Mr. James A. Malcolm, who was already aware of German pre-war efforts to secure a foothold in Palestine through the Zionist Jews and of the abortive Anglo-French demarches at Washington and New York, and knew that Mr. Woodrow Wilson, for good and sufficient reasons, always attached the greatest possible importance to the advice of a very prominent Zionist, Mr. Justice Brandeis, of the U.S. Supreme Court, and was in close touch with Mr. Greenberg, editor of the Jewish Chronicle, London, and knew that several important Zionist Jewish leaders had already gravitated to London from the continent on the Key Vive, awaiting events and appreciated and realized the depth and strength of Jewish national aspirations, spontaneously took the initiative to convince, first of all, Sir Mark Sykes, undersecretary to the War Cabinet, and afterwards Monsieur Georges Picot of the French Embassy in London, and Monsieur Goot of the Quai d'Orsay, Eastern Section, that the best and perhaps the only way, which proved so to be, to induce the American president to come into the war was to secure the cooperation of Zionist Jews by promising them Palestine, and thus enlist and mobilize the hitherto unsuspectedly powerful forces of Zionist Jews in America and elsewhere in favor of the Allies on a quid pro quo contract basis. Thus, as will be seen, the Zionists, having carried out their part and greatly helped to bring America in, the Balfour Declaration of 1917 was but the public confirmation of the necessarily secret gentlemen's agreement of 1916 made with the previous knowledge, acquiescence, and or approval of the Arabs and of the British, American, French, and other allied governments, and not merely a voluntary altruistic and romantic gesture on the part of Great Britain 
as certain people either through pardonable ignorance assume or unpardonable ill will would represent or misrepresent. Sir Mark Sykes was undersecretary to the War Cabinet, specially concerned with Near Eastern affairs, and, although at the time scarcely acquainted with the Zionist movement and unaware of the existence of its leaders, he had the flair to respond to the arguments advanced by Mr. Malcolm as to the strength and importance of this movement in Jewry, in spite of the fact that many wealthy and prominent international or semi-assimilated Jews in Europe and America were openly or tacitly opposed to it, Zionist movement, or timidly indifferent. M. M. Pico and Gout were likewise receptive. An interesting account of the negotiations carried on in London and Paris, and subsequent developments, has already appeared in the Jewish press, and need not be repeated here in detail, except to recall that immediately after the gentleman's agreement between Sir Mark Sykes, authorized by the War Cabinet, and the Zionist leaders, cable facilities through the War Office, the Foreign Office, and British embassies, legations, etc., were given to the latter to communicate the glad tidings to their friends and organizations in America and elsewhere, and the change in official and public opinion, as reflected in the American press, in favor of joining the Allies in the war, was as gratifying as it was surprisingly rapid. In Germany, the value of the bargain to the Allies, apparently, was duly and carefully noted. In his Through Thirty Years, Mr. Wickham Steed, in a chapter appreciative of the value of Zionist support in America and elsewhere to the Allied cause, says General Ludendorff is alleged to have said after the war that the Balfour Declaration was the cleverest thing done by the Allies in the way of propaganda and that he wished Germany had thought of it first. Footnote, Volume 2, page 392. As a matter of fact, this was said by Ludendorff to Sir Alfred Mond, afterwards Lord Melchett, soon after the war. The fact that it was Jewish help that brought USA into the war on the side of the Allies has rankled ever since in German especially Nazi minds, and has contributed in no small measure to the prominence which anti-Semitism occupies in the Nazi program. Zionist Jews asserted their influence in the uppermost positions of the United States government through corrupt means and caused Americans terrible and deadly harm. The Zionists subverted the American government undermined the sovereignty of the United States, stripped it of its independence from England, and destroyed the rights of self-determination and representative government of the American people. They brought war to and against America and killed American citizens for their own selfish reasons. They took America's ally Russia out of the war, costing more American lives and treasure. They drove a wedge between America and Germany and created America's worst enemy, the Soviet Union, out of America's ally, Russia, and they built up America's enemy, Imperial Japan. They also redirected British troops to Palestine, which could have instead helped save American lives in Europe. It was widely known that while serving as president at Princeton University, Woodrow Wilson, who was to become president of the United States of America, had engaged in an illicit affair with a married woman known as Mrs. Peck, Mary Allen Peck, a.k.a. Mary Allen Holbert. Mrs. Peck divorced her husband and remarried. Her second marriage also failed. Mrs. Peck retained Louis Marshall's law partner, Samuel Untermeyer, to bring suit against President Wilson for breach of promise. She alleged that Wilson had promised to marry her should his wife die, but when his wife did die, he did not. Samuel Untermeyer was a Zionist patron and worked together with Louis Brandeis. Brandeis was a Frankist Jew, disreputable lawyer, a Rothschild partisan in the banking investigations, corrupt war profiteer, co-author of Henry Ford's Apology to the Jews, and later one of the chief organizers of the international boycott against German goods in 1933. Louis Marshall was one of the founders of the American Jewish Committee and was extremely influential. Mrs. Peck offered up Wilson's love letters as proof of her allegation. Wilson did not marry Mrs. Peck when his first wife died and instead married Mrs. Edith Bowling Galt. Mrs. Peck demanded $75,000 from the president for breach of promise. Wilson did not have the money. If made public, these letters could have destroyed Wilson's political career. 
Samuel Untermeyer and Louis Brandeis blackmailed President Wilson with Wilson's love letters from his affair with Mrs. Peck and forced Wilson to nominate the outspoken and unpopular Frankist Zionist Louis Dembitz Brandeis for the United States Supreme Court. Brandeis was the most hated lawyer in the United States. In return, Untermeyer paid Mrs. Peck $65,000 through the Zionist banker and multimillionaire Bernard Baruch, who became chairman of the War Industries Board under Wilson and was a notorious war profiteer. Baruch proclaimed that he had more power during the war than any other person. The Jewish leadership in America profiteered immensely from the First World War and did not care about the American lives lost to generate their profits and forward the Zionist cause. The comparatively small investment of $65,000 paid back massive dividends to these corrupt and corrupting men. The New York Times reported on the 25th of August, 1917, on the front page, American Board to Buy for Allies. Baruch, Lovett, and Brookings named to make all purchases here. Big economies expected. European allies have been boosting prices by competitive dealings more loans. Special to the New York Times. Washington. August 24th. Official announcement was made tonight that an agreement had been reached between the governments of the United States, Great Britain, France, and Russia, by which all purchases in this country for these allied governments would be made by an American commission composed of Bernard M. Baruch, Robert S. Lovett, and Robert S. Brookings. The announcement followed conferences today between the Secretary of the Treasury, Lord Northcliffe, Special Representative of Great Britain, Ambassador Jusserand of France, and Ambassador Bakhmatev of Russia. The agreement provides that hereafter all purchases of supplies of every description shall be made for account of this government and the Allied governments concerned. It is understood that Italy will assent to the agreement. The official announcement, issued by Secretary McAdoo, was as follows. Formal agreements were signed today by the Secretary of the Treasury, with the approval of the President, on behalf of the United States, and by the representatives of Great Britain, France, and Russia, for the creation of a commission with headquarters at Washington, through which all purchases made by those governments in the United States shall proceed. It is expected that similar agreements will be signed with representatives of other Allied governments within the next few days. The agreement's name, Bernard M. Baruch, Robert S. Lovett, and Robert S. Brookings as the commission. These gentlemen are also members of the recently created War Industries Board of the Council of National Defense and will thereby be able thoroughly to coordinate the purchases of the United States government with the purchases of the Allied powers. It is believed that these arrangements will result in a more effective use of the combined resources of the United States and foreign governments in the prosecution of the war. As rapidly as practicable other countries engaged in the war against the Central Powers will be brought into the arrangement. The Purchasing Commission will have headquarters in Washington and will avail itself of all the organized facilities already in operation for the prosecution of the war. The War Industries Board has had charge of enormous buying projects in the short time it has been in existence. Its members are intimately acquainted with every phase of the many business conditions involved in the supply of munitions and war supplies. They have acted with the constant cooperation and direction of President Wilson. The action taken in forming the Purchasing Commission to take charge of the buying for all the Allies has been rendered necessary because of the continual disadvantages in the markets for various supplies resulting from the competitive buying of the many representatives of the different belligerent countries in the United States. One of the most distinct difficulties occurring in this line became known within the past ten days, when it was found that France was buying copper in very large amounts in this country at a price far in excess of the likely to be paid by the United States under existing agreements with the Copper Syndicate. Similar instances were also found in the matter of buying wheat and meat supplies. In some cases, it was found that agents of the Allied countries had combed the Western markets for grain months in advance of any efforts of American buyers and had large quantities of materials stored awaiting favorable conditions of shipment, while prices went upward in consequence of the steadily increasing scarcity of certain staples. The Commission will begin its work at once. 
All programs for the purchase of war supplies will be laid before it and will receive its consideration and be carried out under its direction. In the conferences today, it was developed that the monthly program of advances of money by this government to the Allies would be subject to a material increase in totals. The Italian campaign will require a larger credit, and other allowances will be larger hereafter. The total of $500 million a month heretofore loaned will be increased to $600 million. This money will be for the greater part expended in this country in the purchase of war supplies for the Allies and under the direction of the new Purchasing Commission. Louis Dembitz Brandeis became the first Jewish Supreme Court justice appointed to the United States Supreme Court, though not the first nominated. Untermeyer was extremely instrumental in Brandeis' nomination and subsequent appointment. Brandeis and Untermeyer were both men of ill repute, and Brandeis's nomination was scandalous and strongly opposed by many newspapers, the Bar Association, senators, former President Taft, etc. He only made it through by blackmailing President Wilson. Brandeis and Untermeyer worked together to secure the banking interests of the United States for the Rothschild family, largely through Jacob H. Schiff's firm, Kuhn, Loeb and Company, and the Warburgs. Both Brandeis and Untermeyer, and Untermeyer's law partner, Louis Marshall, were notorious shysters. Many former government officials and numerous active officials in the government sought to prevent Brandeis's appointment to the Supreme Court, and a massive campaign was waged against him in fear that he might be appointed, which story was well covered in the New York Times over the period of several months. Louis Dembitz Brandeis was a Frankist Jew. Frankist Jews were committed to the destruction of Gentile society. They deliberately wormed their way into positions of power in order to subvert Gentile religions and governments and bring them into war, debt, revolution, and ruin. Brandeis brought America into the First World War in a quid pro quo deal with the British in exchange for the Zionist Balfour Declaration by blackmailing Woodrow Wilson with love letters Wilson had written to Mrs. Peck. Brandeis and his leading Jewish friends instituted the Rothschild's banking system in America with the creation of the Federal Reserve. This led to the Great Depression when the Fed contracted the money supply. Brandeis was known as the most deceitful lawyer in America. His appointment to the United States Supreme Court was the most scandalous event in the court's history. Like all Frankist Jews, Brandeis returned Gentile generosity with treachery. Arthur Hertzberg discussed Brandeis's Frankist roots. On the surface, Brandeis was a strange kind of leader for the Zionists. Born in Louisville, Kentucky in 1856 to recent immigrants from Bohemia who were not much involved in Jewish life, Brandeis had a brilliant career at Harvard Law School and by the late 1880s had become a successful Boston lawyer. True, many of his initial clients were German Jews to whose social set he inevitably belonged, but he was even more peripheral to the Jewish community than the most assimilated among them. There was some memory in his family of its origins in Prague, in a circle that still harbored loyalty to the memory of Jacob Frank, the false messiah who had appeared in Poland in the latter half of the 18th century. Brandeis's mother was very opposed to Jewish particularism. In his earliest Boston years, he was to be found, at least once, on the list of contributors to the First Unitarian Church. On the other hand, he had been deeply influenced in his earliest years by an uncle, Louis Dembitz, whose family name he adopted as his own middle name, a learned Orthodox Jew. If Untermeyer and Brandeis had not blackmailed Wilson, Brandeis, who was so widely hated and of such poor reputation, never would have been considered for, let alone been nominated or appointed to, the U.S. Supreme Court. Nicholas Murray Butler wrote in 1936, When on January 28, 1916, President Wilson nominated Louis D. Brandeis of Boston to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, there was furious criticism and opposition to the confirmation of this appointment from many members of the bench and bar. Theodore Herzl's Honorary Secretary in London, Jacob Judah Aaron de Haas, persuaded Brandeis to become a Zionist. Brandeis was privy to Zionist secrets and, being a United States Supreme Court justice, 
was a powerful and very well-connected spokesman for and instrument of Zionist policy in the United States. De Haas maintained a strong influence over Brandeis, and Brandeis in turn controlled President Wilson. The Zionists had an American dictator under their complete control. The Zionists used their influence over Woodrow Wilson to bring America into the First World War on the side of British in exchange for the Balfour Declaration. W.J.M. Childs wrote in 1924, and note especially the line, the entry of Turkey into the war brought the hitherto impracticable dreams of Zionism within the bounds of possible attainment. Much is heard of the Balfour Declaration as an instrument conferring upon the Jewish race unwarrantable privileges in a land from which that race had been effectively dispersed. There has been remarkably little said as to the reasons of high policy which impelled the Allies to adopt the purpose of the Declaration as one of their war aims. To some extent, altruistic motives influenced certain Gentile protagonists of the Zionism expressed in the Declaration. At a time when justice for oppressed races and small peoples had become an Allied slogan, it was at least consistent to include the Jews among those whose wrongs might be righted as an outcome of the war but we well may doubt how far such considerations, standing alone, would have carried the Allied governments towards accepting the restoration of the Jewish people to Palestine as a war aim. The truth is, of course, that for Great Britain and her allies the policy indicated in the Declaration was most definitely a war measure, well calculated to yield results of immense importance to the Allied cause. And further, that for Great Britain, special reasons existed why she should adopt and support the policy of the Declaration. These may be found in the obvious advantages of covering the Suez Canal by an outpost territory, in which important elements of the population would not only be bound to her by every interest, but would command the support of world Jewry. That was the long view of British imperial interests, taken in 1916 and 1917, it counted for much then, but for even more after the war. But apart from exclusive British interests, the Declaration may be described as essentially a war measure adopted by the powers of the Entente in the furtherance of their own vital interests. Defined in greater detail, it was a bold, imaginative, and statesmanlike effort to prevent the incalculable and universal influence of Jewry being exerted on the side of the central powers, as, indeed, it was, to a serious extent, then being exerted and to transfer this highly important influence to the cause of the Entente. Nor was it a project of sudden origin, or hastily embraced. The advantages to be gained if the policy of the Declaration were adopted had long been urged. Opposition to that policy had long been active. Before the British government gave the Declaration to the world, it had been closely examined in all its bearings and implications, weighed word by word, and subjected to repeated change and amendment. Unless full weight be given to these antecedent facts, no correct judgment upon the Declaration and its policy in operation can be formed. 2. The Zionists and the Declaration Zionism had been a living and ambitious force in the Jewish world long before 1914. While awaiting its real opportunity, it had, in 1905, rejected the tempting offer of territory for the creation of a Zionist state in Uganda under the British flag. It had steadily looked to Palestine as the one land which could provide the historical connection essential to Zionist aims. The entry of Turkey into the war brought the hitherto impracticable dreams of Zionism within the bounds of possible attainment. If the goodwill of the Allies, particularly of Great Britain, could be secured, and provided that ultimate success should attend the Allied arms, much might be done to realize the dearest ambitions of Zionism. It lay with Zionist leaders to bring their ideal before the British government as a scheme likely to be of advantage to the Entente. Suffice to say that at this crisis of its fortunes, Zionism was fortunate that in Dr. C. Weisman and Mr. N. Sokoloff, it found two leaders equal to the great occasion, that British statesmen, including Mr. Now Lord, Balfour, Lord Milner, Mr. Lloyd George, Lord Robert Cecil, immediately recognized the political importance and value of the Zionist suggestions, 
and that in the subsequent long negotiations and discussions by which the aims of Zionism were harmonized with the political realities of the situation, the British negotiators were Mr. Balfour and the late Sir Mark Sykes, both of them convinced and ardent supporters of Zionist aspirations. These British representatives and the Zionist leaders just named must be credited with the chief part in framing the policy of the Declaration. Support of Zionist ambitions, indeed, promised much for the cause of the Entente. Quite naturally, Jewish sympathies were to a great extent anti-Russian, and therefore in favor of the Central Powers. No ally of Russia, in fact, could escape sharing that immediate and inevitable penalty for long and savage Russian persecution of the Jewish race. But the German general staff desired to attach Jewish support yet more closely to the German side. With their wide outlook on possibilities, they seem to have urged, early in 1916, the advantages of promising Jewish restoration to Palestine under an arrangement to be made between Zionists and Turkey, backed by a German guarantee. The practical difficulties were considerable, the subject perhaps dangerous to German relations with Turkey, and the German government acted cautiously. But the scheme was by no means rejected or even shelved, and at any moment the Allies might have been forestalled in offering this supreme bid. In fact, in September 1917, the German government were making the most serious efforts to capture the Zionist movement. Another most cogent reason why the policy of the Declaration should be adopted by the Allies lay in the state of Russia herself. Russian Jews had been secretly active on behalf of the Central Powers from the first. They had become the chief agents of German pacifist propaganda. By 1917, they had done much in preparation for that general disintegration of Russian national life, later recognized as the Revolution. It was believed that if Great Britain declared for the fulfillment of Zionist aspirations in Palestine under her own pledge, one effect would be to bring Russian Jewry to the cause of the Entente. It was believed, also, that such a declaration would have a potent influence upon world Jewry in the same way and secure for the Entente the aid of Jewish financial interests. It was believed, further, that it would greatly influence American opinion in favor of the Allies. Such were the chief considerations which, during the later part of 1916 and the next ten months of 1917, impelled the British government towards making a contract with Jewry. But when the matter came before the cabinet for decision delays occurred, amongst influential English Jews, Zionism had few supporters, at all events for a Zion in Palestine. It had still fewer in France. Jewish influence both within and without the cabinet is understood to have exerted itself strenuously and pertinaciously against the policy of the proposed declaration. Under the pressure of allied needs, the objections of the anti-Zionists were either overruled or the causes of objection removed, and the Balfour Declaration, as we have seen, was published to the world on the 2nd of November, 1917. That it is in purpose a definite contract with Jewry is beyond question. Subsequently, the declaration was accepted and endorsed by the governments of France, Italy, and Japan. That it is in purpose a definite contract between the British government and Jewry represented by the Zionists is beyond question. In spirit, it is a pledge that in return for services to be rendered by Jewry, the British government would use their best endeavors to secure the execution of a certain definite policy in Palestine. No time limit is set for performance. Completion alone appears to have been intended as the conclusion of the contract. It would thus seem to be an agreement incapable of being greatly varied except by consent. How far the implied services of Jewry have been or may yet be rendered cannot be estimated and must always remain a matter of opinion. The Declaration certainly rallied world Jewry as a whole to the side of the Entente. The war was won by the Entente, and to the Declaration as a measure to that end may be attributed a share in achieving the great result. And it is possible to understand from many sources that directly and indirectly the services expected of Jewry were not expected in vain, and were, from the point of view of British interests alone, well worth the price which had to be paid.
Nor is it to be supposed that the services already rendered are the last it well may be that in time to come, Jewish support will much exceed in importance any thought possible in the past. That, however, is a possibility for Palestine of the future to demonstrate. The Armenian Zionist James Aratoon Malcolm came up with the idea of blackmailing Wilson into joining the British cause in the war in exchange for the Balfour Declaration. In reference to the above article, Malcolm wrote in a letter to the editor which was styled Migration into Palestine. Balfour Declaration and published in the London Times on the 25th of July, 1944, on page 2. As during the last war, it was my lot to initiate the negotiations which culminated in the Balfour Declaration. The official historian of the Peace Conference, Professor H.W.V. Temperley, calls it a definite contract between the British government and Jewry. James A. Malcolm's obituary in the London Times, on the 14th of August, 1952, on page 6, stated, among other things, in a section written by a Zionist correspondent, it was James Malcolm's useful and timely initiative in 1916 which brought together the war cabinet and the Zionist leaders. Out of this contact, there eventually emerged an agreement whereby the Zionists helped to gain the goodwill of United States Jewry, and in particular help in gaining the United States as an ally. In return, the restoration of Palestine to the Jews was to be declared a war aim. Bernard Shaw wrote in 1930, The controversy proved superfluous after all. For the Foreign Trade Department at the Admiralty, in the sensible hands of Sir Richard Webb, consented to pay for the confiscated cargoes. The support of the American Jews was purchased by Lord Balfour at the price of Jerusalem, Zion. And the sinking of the Lusitania by a German submarine not only removed the danger of America coming into the war on the German side, but practically forced her in on our side. Concerned that the Jewish Zionist Chaim Weizmann had not recognized James A. Malcolm's leading role in drawing America into the war through the influence of American Jews, including Brandeis. Malcolm Thompson wrote in a letter to the editor published as Origin of the Balfour Declaration. In the London Times, literary supplement of the 22nd of July, 1949, on page 473, in response to their review of Chaim Weizmann's book, Trial and Error, quoting from Adolf Bohm's Die Zionistische Bewegung, Mr. Malcolm, president of the Armenian National Committee in London, advised Sir Mark Sykes to influence Wilson through Brandeis and to guarantee Palestine forthwith to the Jews in order to gain their support. After discussion with Lord Milner, Sykes begged Mr. Malcolm to put him into touch with the Zionist leaders, because Sir Edward Gray and Mr. Balfour were convinced of the justice of the Zionist demand for Palestine. Through Greenberg, Malcolm made contact with Weizmann. The Foreign Office had sent word to Brandeis and through him had worked on Wilson in Washington. Mr. Malcolm, President Desarmonition National Comities in London, Riot Sir Mark Sykes, Wilson Dirch Brandeis Zubian Flusen und den Juden, um Sia Gunstig zu Stimmen, Gleichzeitig Palestina zu Sikern, Nach Ruxprache mit Lord Milner bat Sykes Mr. Malcolm, IHN mit den Zionistischen Führern in Verbindung zu Setzen, Da Sir Edward Gray und Mr. Balfour von der Gerechtigkeit der Zionistischen Forderung auf Palestina überzeugt sein. Dirch Greenberg trat Malcolm auch mit Weismann in Verbindung. Footnote Uber die hier dargestellten Vorganges jehe den Bericht Uber die Balfour Declaration von S. Landmann, der von 1917 to 1922, Secretar der Zionistischen Executive War in World Jewry, London, 1935, Nonder 42 and 43. Malcolm Thompson wrote in a letter to the editor under the heading The Balfour Declaration in the London Times on the 2nd of November, 1949, on page 5. A change of attitude was, however, brought about through the initiative of Mr. James A. Malcolm, who pressed on Sir Mark Sykes, then Undersecretary to the War Cabinet, the thesis that an Allied offer to restore Palestine to the Jews would swing over from the German to the Allied side the very powerful influence of American Jews, including Judge Brandeis, the friend and advisor of President Wilson. 
British Prime Minister David Lloyd George stated before the House of Commons on the 19th of June, 1936, the obligations of the mandate are specific and definite. They are to encourage the establishment of a national home for the Jews without detriment to any of the rights of the Arab population. I agree that it is a dual undertaking, and we must see that both parts of the mandate are thoroughly enforced. But look at the conditions under which we entered into it. It was one of the darkest periods of the war when Mr. Balfour prepared his declaration. Let me recall the circumstances to the House. At the time the French army had mutinied, the Italian army was on the eve of collapse, and America had hardly started preparing in earnest. There was nothing left but Britain confronting the most powerful military combination the world has ever seen. It was important for us to seek every legitimate help we could get. We came to the conclusion, from information we received from every part of the world, that it was vital we should have the sympathies of the Jewish community. I can assure the committee that we did not come to that conclusion from any predilections or prejudices. Certainly we had no prejudices against the Arabs, because at that moment we had hundreds and thousands of troops fighting for Arab emancipation from the Turk. In these circumstances, and on the advice which we received, we decided that it was desirable to secure the sympathy and cooperation of that most remarkable community, the Jews, throughout the world. They were helpful in America and in Russia, which at that moment was just walking out and leaving us alone. In these conditions, we proposed this to our allies. France accepted it, Italy accepted it, and the United States accepted it, all the other allies accepted it, and all the nations which constitute the League of Nations accepted it. And the Jews, I am here to bear testimony to the fact with all the influence they possess, responded nobly to the appeal which was made. I do not know whether the House realizes how much we owe to Dr. Weizmann with his marvelous scientific brain. He absolutely saved the British Army at a critical moment when a particular ingredient which was essential we should have for our great guns was completely exhausted. His great chemical genius enabled us to solve that problem. But he is only one out of many who rendered great services to the Allies. It is an obligation of honor which we undertook, to which the Jews responded. We cannot get out of it without dishonor. Frank Owen wrote in his book, Tempestuous Journey. Lloyd George, his life and times, enough for a day? No. There was trouble in the House of Lords about honors, and there was always Ireland. But something or rather, somebody else was about to cause still more division in the war cabinet. There was another persistent people knocking at the door, and one with a still older history of oppression and exile. The Jews, for nearly 2,000 years, the Jews had been wanting and waiting to return to the land of their fathers. Next year in Jerusalem, they toasted at their Passover. But it was not until about the dawn of the present century that the powerful Zionist movement had been born, a worldwide organization pledged to restore Palestine as the national homeland of the Jewish people. They were not likely to overlook the possibilities of action opened up by a world war, and when the contemporary tyrant occupier of their ancient country, the Turk, took the side of the central powers, the Zionists naturally sought succor from the Allies. One of their leading members was a Russian Jew named Dr. Weizmann. The reader has met him already, with Lloyd George one day in 1915 at the Ministry of Munitions, when the brilliant scientist set to work to produce the then vitally needed acetone. In declining any honor or award to himself for his services, he had told Lloyd George of the national aspirations of his own people. Dr. Wiseman already knew Balfour and had worked under him at the Admiralty. To him, too, the ardent Zionist confided his dreams, and Balfour had been perhaps more impressed. Asquith, who was still prime minister in those days, had not been so encouraging. He had his good reasons. One was that secret Sykes-Picot Pact of May 1916, whereby the Allies had agreed to carve up the Turkish Empire in the Middle East into Russian, French, and British zones. The proposed Anglo-French dividing line cut right through Palestine. By the autumn of that year, however, a still stronger reason had arisen for revising this arrangement. This was the urgent necessity of winning over the goodwill of American Jewry to the Allied cause. 
for the Germans had not been idle in courting Zionism either, notably addressing themselves to the Russian Jews. So under a new war cabinet which included Lloyd George, Balfour, and Smuts, another strong sympathizer with the ideas of Zionism, there had gone forth secret assurances to the Zionist leaders that Britain would support their claims if she could carry her allies with her. One thus addressed was Justice Brandeis, an outstanding figure of the movement in the United States and a close personal friend of President Wilson. A Zionist delegation, which included Dr. Weitzman, Sir Herbert Samuel, and Mr. James de Rothschild, MP, had journeyed to Paris and there secured the agreement of the French government. Throughout the summer of 1917, Balfour kept up his talks with the Zionists, and on the 3rd of September, he laid before the War Cabinet the draft of a public statement to be made by the British government endorsing and proclaiming all that had been promised in private. But not everybody was pro-Zionist, and perhaps the least unanimous, in fact, they were about equally divided, were the people most concerned. Within the War Cabinet itself, two more meetings were required before a bridge could be built to span the differences, and in public life, outside, the rifts long remained. Fiercest opposition of all came from wealthy Jews, who feared that if a Jewish national state were established, they might lose their own status as citizens of the countries where they and their forebears had long dwelt and prospered. Lloyd George's own old friend, Sir Charles Henry, MP, was foremost among these anti-Zionists, and he did not delay any longer to found an anti-Zionist newspaper, The Jewish Guardian, to express his views. In the War Cabinet, the new Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, led the anti-Zionist party. In a stormy meeting on the 4th of October, 1917, Balfour warned of a new German drive to capture the Zionist forces for the enemy side, and he claimed that though some rich Jews in Britain might oppose the idea of Zionism, it was enthusiastically backed by those in America and Russia. On whose side were those influential people to be ranged? There was no inconsistency whatever in having a Jewish national home and Jews being members of other states. The French government were sympathetic to the idea, and so, as he personally knew, was President Wilson. Edwin Montague rose. He most strongly objected to a national home for Jews, insisting that the Jews were really only a religious community and that he was himself a Jewish Englishman. He turned to Lloyd George. All my life, he said, I have been trying to get out of the ghetto. You want to force me back there. Curzon was opposed to the proposal on other grounds. Ah, well did he recollect a journey he had made through the promised land many years ago now. Alas, it was a barren land, with little cultivation even on the terraced slopes and watered by all too few streams. How could this place of stone and sand become a home for millions more Jews? Moreover, what about the Moslems already living there? Milner interposed to declare himself in favor of the national home for Jews, provided nothing was done to prejudice the civil and religious rights of the non-Jews in Palestine or the political status of Jews elsewhere. The prime minister ruled that the war cabinet had heard enough for one day. There was still a war on. Resolved to hear the further views of Zionists, anti-Zionists, non-Zionists, and President Wilson. The days passed, a week, three weeks. The Jews, at any rate the pro-Zionist Jews, were getting restive. In particular, Lord Rothschild, the head of his house. He had been in correspondence with Balfour since mid-July and was beginning to wonder if anything was going to happen in the war cabinet or not. Because decidedly, something was happening in Palestine. The British army was marching in. After three years holdup, 80% of it by Turkish bluff, the considerable contribution of British Army intelligence in accepting it must not be entirely overlooked. Our far more powerful forces in Egypt had begun to take the offensive against a war-weary enemy, who now counted as many deserters as troops remaining on his battle strength. Jerusalem by Christmas, Lloyd George had demanded of General Allenby in appointing him to the Egypt command in the summer of 1917. Now Allenby had crossed the desert from Egypt, turned the weak Turkish line at Gaza by a brilliant maneuver, and was moving on the holy city. This he would take, 
entering humbly on foot a fortnight before Christmas Day. At a Third War Cabinet, the 31st of October, 1917, Balfour once more brought up the question of the national home. How could its establishment possibly prejudice Jews elsewhere? Surely, on the analogy of a European immigrant in the United States, it would help that they had a recognized land of origin. As for the present poverty of Palestine, the scientific development of her resources might yet make it a land flowing with milk and honey. Curzon followed. He delivered another reminiscent address on his travels in the Middle East, which the Prime Minister this time interrupted to ask if he agreed with some expression of sympathy. Resolved. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall he done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Next day, Lloyd George presented this draft to the leaders of British Jewry. Of eight of them, four accepted it, including the chief rabbi, Dr. Hertz, one was neutral and three were hostile. Thus, the famous Balfour Declaration was delivered to the world. Next year, France, Italy, and the United States all declared their accord with this policy. But what was the policy? Lloyd George himself, in later years, insisted that what he had meant was that Jews should be free to go to Palestine and settle there in such strength as the land could support or be made to support. Then, in due course, they should set up their own autonomous Jewish administration. By no means all Jews would go there, any more than all the Irish-born returned to Ireland. It did not work out that way. The Jewish question, like the Irish question, had been too long part of history to be dismissed from it overnight. But the troubles this generation has known were far ahead in October 1917. There was also a new row raging between the Zionist and the anti-Zionist Jews. His foreign secretary Balfour was no Jew, but he was the foremost and certainly the most famous Christian Zionist. William D. Rubenstein argues that one of the drafts of the Balfour Declaration was written by a crypto-Jew named Leopold Charles Moritz Stennett Amory. Amory's family feigned conversion to Protestantism. His mother was perhaps the child of Frankist Jews who fled Hungary after the Revolution of 1848 and who eventually settled in England by way of Constantinople. Many Jews and crypto-Jews emerged from Turkish Donme training grounds to become prominent Zionist spokesmen and leaders, as well as revolutionaries who set about to subvert the societies into which they moved. Perhaps beginning with Bohemia, Poland, Salonika, and Paris, these crypto-Jewish Donme have established subversive groups around the world, Amory was a leading force in unseating Chamberlain's government and installing the committed Zionist Winston Churchill as prime minister. Leopold Amory's son John, outwardly an anti-Semite and a fascist like so many crypto-Jewish Zionists of the period, betrayed England and helped the Zionist Nazis to chase the Jews of Europe toward Palestine. He was hanged for treason after the war. A typical Zionist leader of his time, Leopold Amory, together with Chaim Weizmann, also helped betray one million, by his own account, Hungarian Jews to death. Benjamin Harrison Friedman wrote of the Persian-Armenian James A. Malcolm. Mr. James A. Malcolm was an Oxford-educated Armenian, who had been appointed to take charge of Armenian interests during and after the war. In his official capacity as advisor to the British government on Eastern affairs, he had frequent contact with the cabinet office, the foreign office, the War Office, and the French and other Allied embassies in London, and made visits to Paris for consultation with his colleagues and leading French officials. He was passionately devoted to an Allied victory. While his home in London was being bombed by the Germans in 1944, he prepared the following account which speaks for itself. Mr. Malcolm feared he would not survive, and prepared the following which he deposited in the British Museum for the benefit of posterity. It has become one of the most important documents explaining how the United States was railroaded into World War I and follows here. 
During one of my visits to the War Cabinet Office in Whitehall Gardens in the late summer of 1916, I found Sir Mark Sykes less buoyant than usual. I inquired what was troubling him. He spoke of military deadlock in France, the growing menace of submarine warfare, the unsatisfactory situation which was developing in Russia, and the general bleak outlook. The cabinet was looking anxiously for United States intervention. He had thought of enlisting the substantial Jewish influence in the United States, but had been unable to do so. Reports from America revealed a very pro-German tendency among the wealthy American Jewish bankers and bond houses, nearly all of German origin, and among Jewish journalists who took their cue from them. I inquired what special argument or consideration had the Allies put forward to win over American Jewry. Sir Mark replied that he made use of the same argument as used elsewhere, viz., that we shall eventually win, and it was better to be on the winning side. I informed him that there was a way to make American Jewry thoroughly pro-Ally, and make them conscious that only an Allied victory could be of permanent benefit to Jewry all over the world. I said to him, you are going the wrong way about it. Do you know of the Zionist movement? Sir Mark admitted ignorance of this movement, and I told him something about it, and concluded by saying, you can win the sympathy of the Jews everywhere in one way only, and that way is by offering to try and secure Palestine for them. Sir Mark was taken aback. He confessed that what I had told him was something quite new and most impressive. He told me that Lord Milner was greatly interested to learn of the Jewish nationalist movement, but could not see any possibility of promising Palestine to the Jews. I replied that it seemed to me the only way to achieve the desired result, and mentioned that one of President Wilson's most intimate friends, for whose humanitarian views he has the greatest respect, was Justice Brandeis of the Supreme Court, who was a convinced Zionist. If he could obtain from the war cabinet an assurance that help would be given towards securing Palestine for the Jews, it was certain that Jews in all neutral countries would become pro-British and pro-ally. I said I thought it would be sufficient if I were personally convinced of the sincerity of the cabinet's intentions so that I could go to the Zionists and say, if you help the Allies, you will have the support of the British in securing Palestine for the Jews. A day or two later, he informed me that the cabinet had agreed to my suggestion and authorized me to open negotiations with the Zionists. The messages which were sent to the Zionist leaders in Russia were intended to hearten them and obtain their support for the Allied cause. Other messages were sent to Jewish leaders in neutral countries, and the result was to strengthen the pro-Allied sympathies of Jews everywhere. A wealthy and influential anti-Zionist Jewish banker there was shown the telegram announcing the provisional promise of Palestine to the Jews. He was very much moved and said, how can a Jew refuse such a gift? All these steps were taken with the full knowledge and approval of Justice Brandeis, between whom and Zionist leader Dr. Weizmann there was an active interchange of cables. After many anxious weeks and months, my seed had borne fruit, and the government had become an ally of Zionism. The declaration is dated the 2nd of November, 1917, and is known to history as the Balfour Declaration, its obligation to promise British help for the Jews to obtain Palestine. The Jewish Daily Bulletin allegedly wrote on the 30th of October, 1934, on page 3, The new Germany persists toward the complete extermination of the Jew because it was Jews who instigated the United States to enter the World War, accomplishing the defeat of Germany, and who later caused the inflation in Germany, Herr Richard Kunze, a leading Nazi parliament figure, declared at a mass meeting in Magdeburg yesterday. Winston Churchill told William Griffin in August of 1936 in an interview published in the New York Inquirer, America should have minded her own business and stayed out of the World War. If you hadn't entered the war, the Allies would have made peace with Germany in the spring of 1917. Had we made peace then, there would have been no collapse in Russia, followed by communism, no breakdown in Italy, followed by fascism, and Germany would not have signed the Versailles Treaty, which has enthroned Nazism in Germany. If America had stayed out of the war, all these isms wouldn't today be sweeping the continent of Europe and breaking down parliamentary government, and if England had made peace early in 1917, 
it would have saved over one million British, French, American, and other lives. Zionist British Prime Minister David Lloyd George wrote in 1939, the Germans were equally alive to the fact that the Jews of Russia wielded considerable influence in Bolshevik circles. The Zionist movement was exceptionally strong in Russia and America. The Germans were, therefore, engaged actively in courting favor with that movement all over the world. A friendly Russia would mean not only more food and raw material for Germany and Austria, but fewer German and Austrian troops on the Eastern Front, and therefore more available for the West. These considerations were brought to our notice by the Foreign Office and reported to the War Cabinet. The support of the Zionists for the cause of the Entente would mean a great deal as a war measure. Quite naturally, Jewish sympathies were to a great extent anti-Russian and therefore in favor of the Central Powers. No ally of Russia, in fact, could escape sharing that immediate and inevitable penalty for the long and savage Russian persecution of the Jewish race. In addition to this, the German general staff, with their wide outlook on possibilities, urged early in 1916 the advantages of promising Jewish restoration to Palestine under an arrangement to be made between Zionists and Turkey backed by a German guarantee. The practical difficulties were considerable. The subject was perhaps dangerous to German relations with Turkey, and the German government acted cautiously. But the scheme was by no means rejected or even shelved, and at any moment the Allies might have been forestalled in offering this supreme bid. In fact, in September 1917, the German government were making very serious efforts to capture the Zionist movement. Another most cogent reason for the adoption by the Allies of the policy of the Declaration lay in the state of Russia herself. Russian Jews had been secretly active on behalf of the Central Powers from the first. They had become the chief agents of German pacifist propaganda in Russia. By 1917, they had done much in preparing for that general disintegration of Russian society, later recognized as the Revolution. It was believed that if Great Britain declared for the fulfillment of Zionist aspirations in Palestine under her own pledge, one effect would be to bring Russian Jewry to the cause of the Entente. It was believed also that such a declaration would have a potent influence upon world Jewry outside Russia and secure for the Entente the aid of Jewish financial interests. In America, their aid in this respect would have a special value when the Allies had almost exhausted the gold and marketable securities available for American purchases. Such were the chief considerations which, in 1917, impelled the British government towards making a contract with Jewry. Sigmund Freud and William C. Bullitt wrote in 1932, Balfour had replaced Gray as British Foreign Secretary. He came to America in April 1917 to inform Wilson that the condition of the Allies was desperate, that Russia was more than likely to withdraw from the war, that the morale of France was collapsing, that the financial condition of England threatened calamity, and that the United States would have to carry a war burden enormously greater than either Wilson or anyone else in America had anticipated. He was prepared to reveal to Wilson some at least of the secret treaties of the Allies and to discuss war aims, assuming naturally that Wilson would insist on defining the precise aims for which he must ask the people of the United States to pour out a flood of blood and wealth. Wilson wished to settle the question of war aims with Balfour definitely and at once. At that moment, he might have written his own peace terms, and might possibly have turned the war into the crusade for peace which he had proclaimed. The Allies were completely at his mercy. But House persuaded him not to demand a definition of war aims from Balfour by the argument that the discussion which would ensue would interfere with the prosecution of the war. Both Wilson and House overlooked the fact that all the warring powers had discussed their peace terms in detail while prosecuting the war with notable efficiency. House also inserted in Wilson's mind the picture of a peace conference at which England would loyally cooperate with the United States in establishing a just and lasting peace. And Wilson, always anxious to dodge trouble, let slip this opportunity to avoid the terms of the Treaty of Versailles and secure the just peace of which he dreamed. 
both the President and House seem to have misunderstood totally the sort of respect that the governments of Europe had for Wilson. For the President, as wielder of the physical strength of America, they had the greatest respect. For Woodrow Wilson, as a moral leader, they had no respect. So long as the physical assistance of the United States was vital to the Allies, they had to defer to the President of the United States. But Woodrow Wilson was never able to make any European statesman drunk with this spirit of self-sacrifice. Balfour mentioned the existence of some of the secret treaties to Wilson and promised to send them to Wilson. But he never sent them, and having arranged for the utmost physical assistance from the United States, went home happy. Many have argued that the great debts the Allies had accrued caused Wilson to enter the war in order to ensure that America would recover its loans. This argument does not seem plausible for the simple reason that America incurred more expenses by going to war and making additional loans to the Allies than the total monies it stood to lose if England and France were to default on their initial loans. America could not recover these internal expenses, and America itself was financed by its own citizens, who invested large sums in government bonds. In addition, the lives of Americans were far more precious than any monies owed. Beyond that, if Americans were so concerned about repayment and were vitally threatened by default as to go to war, they should not and would not have issued the loans in the first place. Prior to the close of World War I, Germany had provided Jews with more opportunities than any other nation on earth. In return, Germany benefited from Jewish contributions in mathematics, the arts and sciences, the professions, high finance, and from Jewish educators. Many of the most prosperous of the Americans of Jewish descent had emigrated to America from Germany and promoted German businesses and culture in America until the political Zionists began to smear the Germans after obtaining the guarantee of the Balfour Declaration. Then, almost overnight, Germany became a pariah nation in the American press. Germans and those of German descent, including German Jewish immigrants, were resented and persecuted in America. America entered the war on England's side. Many Germans knew that the British then issued the Arthur James Balfour Declaration, actually drafted by Zionists, to Lord Lionel Walter Rothschild in fulfillment of a contract with the Zionists to win the war for England in exchange for Palestine by bringing in America on the Allies' side. The Balfour Declaration states, Foreign Office, November 2, 1917. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. Note that the letter is addressed directly to Lord Rothschild. The British had no lawful authority to make this declaration. The British did not control Palestine, and even if they had, they would have had no right to offer it up to the Jews for settlements. Henry Morgenthau pointed out that leading Jews misrepresented the precise language of the Balfour Declaration, which did not offer to give Palestine to the Jews, but merely expressed support for the idea that Jews might wish to live there under the rule of the indigenous population, it is worthwhile at this point to digress for a moment from my main argument to point out that the Balfour Declaration is itself not even a compromise. It is a shrewd and cunning delusion. I have been astonished to find that such an intelligent body of American Jews as the Central Conference of American Rabbis should have fallen into a grievous misunderstanding of the purport of the Balfour Declaration. In a resolution adopted by them, they assert that the Declaration says, Palestine is to be a national homeland for the Jewish people. Not at all. The actual words of the Declaration, I quote from the official text, 
are His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. These two phrases sound alike, but they are really very different. I can make this obvious by an analogy. When I first read the Balfour Declaration, I was temporarily making my home in the Plaza Hotel. Therefore, I could say with truth, my home is in the Plaza Hotel. I could not say with truth, the Plaza Hotel is my home. If it were my home, I would have the freedom of the whole premises and could occupy any room in the house with impunity. Quite obviously, however, I would not venture to trespass in the rooms of my friend, Mr. John B. Stanchfield, who happened at the same time also to have found a homeland in the plaza, nor in the private quarters of any other resident of that hostelry, whose right to his share in it was as good as mine, and in many cases of much longer standing. The New York Times issued a report on the 19th of November, 1917, on page 5, which serves as evidence of the cooperation of Armenian leadership with the Zionists. They did this in spite of the fact that Zionist Theodore Herzl had secretly conspired with the Sultan of Turkey to cover up the persecution of Armenians, and the young Turk leaders who mass-murdered the Armenians were Jewish, which was widely known through the revelations which had earlier been published in the London Times' Join Zionist Movement. Enlistment of two Rothschilds reported in London Dispatch. The Jewish Morning Journal published the following yesterday as a special dispatch from London. At a reception held in Princess Hall, Piccadilly, London, given by Lord Rothschild, the head of the Rothschild family in England, in celebration of the official declaration by the British government in favor of a Jewish homeland in Palestine, Lord Rothschild announced that his younger brother, Charles, and Baron Edmund de Rothschild of Paris, head of the French branch of the Rothschild family, had joined the Zionist movement. The reception was attended by all the Zionist leaders in England, as well as by prominent Jews and Gentiles. One of the latter, a priest, presented Lord Rothschild with a handsome volume of suitable texts relating to the return of the Jews to Palestine. The prevailing opinion in well-informed Zionist circles in London is that Russia will urge the Interallied Conference to be held soon in Paris to give its approval to Zionism. The Armenian consul in London congratulated the Zionist leaders on their excellent prospect of getting Palestine and expressed a hope that the Jews would prove good neighbors. Lord Swaithling, Lucian Wolfe, the publicist, who is the foreign editor of the London Daily Graphic, and Sir Philip Magnus, a member of Parliament, formed a League of British Jews to combat the view that the Jews form a nation as manifest by the Palestine Declaration of the British Government. This League, however, expresses the readiness to facilitate the settlement of the Jews in Palestine. The German newspaper, Germania, organ of the German Catholic Party, urges the German government to take steps against the alliance of Great Britain and the Zionists. The New York Times reported on the 10th of December, 1917, on page 4, Armenians favor Zion. London Association sends resolutions to Justice Brandeis. The Provisional Zionist Committee yesterday announced that Justice Louis D. Brandeis of the United States Supreme Court has received a letter of congratulation from the Armenian United Association of London on the British Declaration in favor of the establishment of a national Jewish home in Palestine, to which the Cabinet promises that His Majesty's government will exert its best endeavors. The resolution accompanying the letter follows. The Council of the Armenian United Association of London, having read in the press that the British government had now formally expressed its sympathy with the project for the reconstruction of Palestine as the national home of the Jewish people, at their meeting held on November 10, 1917, at the offices of the association, resolved to record their unalloyed gratification and to convey their cordial congratulations and sincere and neighborly greetings to the President, Dr. C. F. Weitzman, Committee and members of the Zionist Federation of Great Britain, and through them to all other Zionist leaders and Zionist organizations, and especially those in the United States, Russia, France, Italy, Poland, and Romania, upon the recognition of Jewish nationality and their righteous, inalienable claim to the historic soil and country of their ancestry. Resolved, further, 
to request the Honorary Secretary to send copies of this resolution to Chief Rabbi Dr. Weitzman, to Lord Rothschild, to Baron Edmund de Rothschild, to Mr. Nahum Sokolow, to Dr. Schlenau of Moscow, to Judge Louis D. Brandeis of the United States Supreme Court, and to the press. The New York Times reported on the 14th of December, 1917. The Jews of Russia, he predicts, will have an important influence. The capture of Jerusalem by the British, he says, will be a weighty factor in the situation. Leading German Catholics and Freemasons also turned on Germany when Jewry decided to bring America into the war against Germany in exchange for the Balfour Declaration and concurrently triggered the Russian and Bolshevik revolutions in Russia, which revolutions freed Jewry from the need for German military support to unseat the Tsar. Matthias Erzberger of the Catholic Center Party turned on Germany at this point and then signed the armistice ending the war. Matthias stabbed Germany in the back and supported the Treaty of Versailles despite the fact that he was a highly vocal advocate for the war at its inception. Henry Wickham Steed captured some of this history in his book Through Thirty Years, 1892-1922, A Personal Narrative, Volume 2, William Heinemann, Limited, London, 1924, pp. 301, 305. The American delegation promptly asked me for a memorandum on these Syrian conversations and sent it to the president, an extra copy being made for the American colonial expert, Mr. Beer. But before matters could proceed far, a flutter was caused by the return from Moscow of Messrs. William C. Bullitt and Lincoln Steffens, who had been sent to Russia towards the middle of February by Colonel House and Mr. Lansing for the purpose of studying conditions, political and economic, therein for the benefit of the American commissioner's plenipotentiary to negotiate peace. Mr. Philip Kerr and, presumably, Mr. Lloyd George knew and approved of this mission. Mr. Bullitt was instructed to return, if possible, by the time President Wilson should have come back to Paris from the United States. Potent international financial interests were at work in favor of the immediate recognition of the Bolshevists, those influences had been largely responsible for the Anglo-American proposal in January to call Bolshevist representatives to Paris at the beginning of the peace conference, a proposal which had failed after having been transformed into a suggestion for a conference with the Bolshevists at Prinkapo. The well-known American Jewish banker, Mr. Jacob Schiff, was known to be anxious to secure recognition for the Bolshevists, among whom Jewish influence was predominant, and Chicharin, the Bolshevist Commissary for Foreign Affairs, had revealed the meaning of the January proposal by offering extensive commercial and economic concessions in return for recognition. At a moment when the Bolshevists were doing their utmost to spread revolution throughout Europe, and when the Allies were supposed to be making peace in the name of high moral principles, a policy of recognizing them as the price of commercial concessions, would have sufficed to wreck the whole peace conference and Europe with it. At the end of March, Hungary was already Bolshevist. Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and even Germany were in danger, and European feeling against the blood-stained fanatics of Russia ran extremely high. Therefore, when it transpired that an American official, connected with the peace conference, had returned after a week's visit to Moscow, with an optimistic report upon the state of Russia and with an authorized Russian proposal for the virtual recognition of the Bolshevist regime by April 10th, dismay was felt everywhere except by those who had been privy to the sending of Mr. Bullitt. Yet another complication, it was apprehended, would be added to the general muddle into which the conference had got itself, and the chances of its succeeding at all would be seriously diminished. On the afternoon of March 26th, an American friend inadvertently gave me a notion that a revival of the Prinkapo proposal, in some form, was in the air. That evening, I wrote to Northcliffe. The Americans are again talking of recognizing the Russian Bolshevists. If they want to destroy the whole moral basis of the peace and of the League of Nations, they have only to do so. And in the Paris Daily Mail of March 27th, I wrote strongly against any proposal to recognize the desperados whose avowed aim is to turn upside down the whole basis of Western civilization. That day, 
Colonel House asked me to call upon him. I found him worried both by my criticism of any recognition of the Bolshevists and by the certainty, which he had not previously realized, that if the president were to recognize the Bolshevists in return for commercial concessions, his whole idealism would be hopelessly compromised as commercialism in disguise. I pointed out to him that not only would Wilson be utterly discredited, but that the League of Nations would go by the board, because all the small peoples and many of the big peoples of Europe would be unable to resist the Bolshevism which Wilson would have accredited. I insisted that, unknown to him, the prime movers were Jacob Schiff, Warburg, and other international financiers, who wished above all to bolster up the Jewish Bolshevists. In order to secure a field for German and Jewish exploitation of Russia, Colonel House argued, however, that without relations of some kind with the Bolshevists, it would be impossible to prevent the utter ruin of Russia and the starvation of thousands of the best Russians who were without food, and that if supplies could be sent to Russia under proper control, the needy might be relieved and the Allied and associated governments might get trustworthy information of the true position in Russia. He asked me, therefore, to meet him and Auchincloss next morning to see if some sound line of policy could not be worked out. This I agreed to do. But shortly after leaving Colonel House, information reached me that Mr. Lloyd George and President Wilson would probably agree next morning to recognize the Bolshevists in accordance with Mr. Bullitt's suggestions. Feeling that there was no time to lose, I wrote forthwith a leading article for the Paris Daily Mail of March 28th called Peace with Honor. Its principal passage ran, The issue is whether the Allied and Associated Governments shall, directly or indirectly, accredit an evil thing known as Bolshevism. Prospects of lucrative commercial enterprise in Russia, of economic concessions and of guarantees for debts, are held out to them if they will only fall down and worship Lenin and Trotsky. There is one man to whom such temptation cannot appeal. His name is Woodrow Wilson. Since he led his country into war against German imperialist militarism and all the forces of international finance and unmoral commercialism that supported it, he has done more than any allied or associated statesman to accredit sane idealism as a positive force in the life of nations. He has stood out as the champion of small peoples and of their rights. He threw the whole strength of the American people into the struggle in support of the ideals he formulated for the world, and he promised them a peace with honor and justice. Were he to bring them a peace with commercialism, belief in the sincerity of Anglo-Saxon idealism would die the world over. Who are the tempters that would dare whisper into the ears of the allied and associated governments? They are not far removed from the men who preached peace with profitable dishonor to the British people in July 1914. They are akin to, if not identical with, the men who sent Trotsky and some scores of associate desperados to ruin the Russian Revolution as a democratic anti-German force in the spring of 1917. They are the spiritual authors of the Principo policy, and they it is who, in reality, inspired the offer of Chicherin, the Bolshevist commissary for foreign affairs, to make economic and commercial concessions to the Allies in connection with the Principo Conference. That intrigue failed. It may be revived. Lenin, who is a sinister fanatic, would promise any price to secure the recognition he needs in order that his agents and helpers in Allied and associated countries may be able to raise their heads and openly to encompass the ruin of ordered democratic civilization by claiming that what allied and associated governments had sanctioned in Russia is lawful and laudable elsewhere. The establishment of just conditions of peace will by itself help to counteract Bolshevism. But the essential thing is that the allied and associated governments should keep their escutcheon clean and be utterly resolved to have no peace that is not a true peace with honor. I had hardly sent this article to the printers when an American friend, Mr. Charles R. Crane, who had been dining with President Wilson, called to see me. He showed great alarm at the turn things were taking. Bullet is back, he said, and the president is already talking Bullet's language. I fear he may ruin everything. Our people at home will certainly not stand for the recognition of the Bolshevists at the bidding of Wall Street. 
He urged me to point out the danger clearly in the Daily Mail. I reassured him and told him that what I could say was already said and that he would find it in the Daily Mail next morning. Before I was up next day, Colonel House telephoned to say that he wished to see me urgently. Apparently, to use an Americanism, my article had got under the president's hide. When I reached the Crayon, House and Auchincloss looked grave. I told them that, had I waited to discuss policy with them before writing my article, the chances were that there would have been no policy to discuss because the president and possibly Lloyd George would have committed themselves to recognition of the Bolshevists that very morning. The colonel begged me, however, in view of the delicacy of the situation, to refrain from further comment until it could be seen how things would go, and I consented on the understanding that nothing irrevocable would be done unless I were informed beforehand. Then the colonel, Auchincloss, and I went for a long drive during which we discussed a possible policy in regard to the Bolshevists. Its main lines were that relations should be established with them in order to secure protection for a kind of Hoover, revictualing mission on conditions that would ensure the relief of non-Bolshevist, as well as of Bolshevist Russians, that military operations supported or undertaken by the Allies against the Bolshevists would cease, that there should be no Bolshevist propaganda in Central Europe or in Allied countries, and that the question of recognition should be reserved until the Bolshevists had shown their wish and their power to maintain orderly government and to respect international engagements. Steed also stated, at pages 390, 393, of those influences, I am persuaded that the power of international Jewry was the strongest. International clericalism, proceeding from the to my mind mistaken view of the interests of the Roman Church which has prevailed in the Vatican and among the Jesuits since the Counter-Reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries, certainly worked to save the Habsburgs and, with them, the pan-German cause, as did the snobbishness and dull conservatism of small aristocratic cliques in allied countries. Yet Jewish influence was more persistent and more efficient. Had it been united, and could it have been coherently directed, it might well have prevailed. But, in point of fact, Jewish idealism served in part to counteract the work of Jewish finance and of Jewish cosmopolitan agencies. This Jewish idealism was of two kinds, though in one of its forms, it strengthened for a time the pro-German and pan-German tendencies of Jewish finance by bringing Jewish hatred of imperial Russia into line with Jewish attachment to Germanism. Its support of Germanism slackened when the Russian Empire fell. Those who hold that Jewry is always guided by material considerations are apt to be woefully wrong. The gulf that severed Western Europe from Russia during the latter half of the 19th century was dug and kept open chiefly by Jewish resentment of Russian persecution of the Jews. Yet that resentment sprang also from Jewish detestation of the Russian Holy Synod and of the Russian Orthodox Church as survivals of medieval Christianity and as promoters of a crusade for the possession of Tsarograd, Constantinople, and of the holy places. Against Russian Christian fanaticism was ranged an intense Jewish fanaticism hardly to be paralleled save among the more militant sects of Islam. This Jewish fanaticism allied itself with the anti-Russian forces before and during the earlier years of the war. It abated only when the Russian Revolution of March 1917 and the subsequent advent of Bolshevism, largely Jewish in doctrine and in personnel, overthrew the Russian Empire and the Russian Orthodox Church. The joy of Jewry at these events was not merely the joy of triumph over an oppressor, but was also gladness at the downfall of hostile religious and semi-religious institutions, a joy, moreover, in which the Vatican shared, as its attitude towards the Bolshevist delegates to the Genoa Conference of April 1922 significantly indicated. When international Jewish sentiment had thus ceased to be actively pro-German, another form of Jewish idealism came more effectively into play. The Zionist, or Jewish National Movement, which was started by the late Dr. Theodore Herzl in the last decade of the 19th century, had fired the imaginations of millions of the younger and poorer Jews throughout the world. 
frowned upon and discouraged by the wealthier assimilationist and semi-assimilationist Jews in various countries, it had nevertheless kindled in the Jewish masses a spirit akin to that of the Maccabeans and had acted upon them as a regenerating force. Towards the end of 1916, mainly through the instrumentality of the late Sir Mark Sykes, then an undersecretary to the British War Cabinet, and of Mr. James A. Malcolm, a prominent British Armenian, the Zionist organizations in Europe and the United States began to identify themselves with the Allied cause. Mr. Malcolm rightly urged that the Jews were less pro-German than anti-Russian, and that their national aspirations were not inimical to the Allied cause. As a result of discussions with Zionist leaders in England, especially Dr. Weizmann, Mr. Sokolow, and Dr. Greenberg, communications were established with prominent American Zionists who used their influence in favor of American participation in the war. The German government had, at various times, approached the Zionists, but had finally estranged them by insisting that German rather than Hebrew should be the recognized Jewish language. Several members of the British government were, on the contrary, frankly in sympathy with Zionism, and in November 1917, the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Balfour, made an official declaration in favor of the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Not only did this declaration increase the interest of American Jewry in the war, but it tended to neutralize the influence in Russia of the pro-German Jewish socialists who were working with the Bolshevists. The efforts subsequently made to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine and the difficulties inherent both in the nature of things and in some aspects of the Jewish character belong rather to the history of the Zionist movement than to the consideration of the broad factors that operated in favor of an Allied victory. But it is incontestable that Zionism played a part in the defeat of the Pan-Germanism, with which so many Jewish financiers and business interests had been identified. General Ludendorff is alleged to have said, after the war, that the Balfour Declaration was the cleverest thing done by the Allies in the way of propaganda, and that he wished Germany had thought of it first. This is a truly German view. The Balfour Declaration was not intended merely as propaganda. It expressed the sincere intention of the British government. It proceeded from recognition of the fact that the soundest and healthiest element in modern Jewry is the spirit which prompts Jews to be proud of their race and to seek, as Jews, openings for their great gifts, rather than as what some Zionists call 105%, Englishmen, Frenchmen, Germans, or Americans. The future of Jewry cannot be foreseen. Since the war, anti-Semitism has revived in many countries. Jewish speculation in the debased currencies of Europe has accentuated hostility towards Jews in general, and Jewish association with Bolshevism has not tended to decrease it. Should the Russian peasantry throw off the dictatorship of the proletariat set up by Lenin and Trotsky in the name of their prophet Marx, the world may witness massacres beside which the pogroms of Tsardom would pale into insignificance. Then again, a great gulf might yawn between the Western world and Russia, a gulf even harder to bridge than that over which the Franco-Russian alliance was built at the end of last century. Anti-Semitism is no cure for the evils which the presence of a disproportionate number of Jews usually bring upon non-Jewish communities. The cure, if cure there be, can only lie in the patient and sympathetic study of Jewry by non-Jews and in the leadership of Jewry itself by Jews intelligent and courageous enough to perceive the limitations of the Jewish genius and to take them into account in framing Jewish policy.